Hey everybody, listen, if you missed last week's webinar, the ABCs of National Tours Explained, you missed a great one, but don't worry, you can still listen to it. All you have to do is join the Producers Perspective Pro. You'll get 30 days for free, and you can listen to that webinar and all the others for free. Check it out, theproducersperspectivepro.com. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, Producers Perspective podcast listeners. I've taken the podcast and gone on the road. I'm out on the West Coast, and I've brought you two guests for the price of one this week. And what a pair of guests they are. I'm very honored to welcome to the podcast producers in just about every form of entertainment there is, from TV to film to Broadway, Mr. Craig Zayden and Mr. Neil Marin. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Nice Thanks. to be here. Yeah, this we've wanted to do this. We we think it's really going to be fun. Good. It's going to be a blast. Craig and Neil run Storyline Entertainment, which produces film, TV, and Broadway shows. They've earned a total of, get this, six Academy Awards, five Golden Globes, 14 Emmy Awards, two Peabody's, a Grammy, six GLAAD, four NAACP, and two Tonys. Huh. Some of their projects owe little-known stuff like the movie versions of Chicago and Hairspray, which helped reignite the movie musical movement. The Broadway revival of How to Succeed with Daniel Radcliffe and Promises. Not only have they won Academy Awards, they've actually produced the Academy Awards three times. Executive produced The Sound of Music Live, The Wiz, Upcoming Hairspray Live, and A Few Good Men, the first live play. And yes, they also produced Smash. Now, there's a resume, uh, and something tells me these guys have a lot more up their sleeves in the years to come. So let's start with how you started in this business. Ha. Ah. I would say student at Brooklyn College, and I've always had a lifelong dream of being in the theater, uh, first as an actor, and when I was going to Brooklyn College, I decided I didn't want the actor's life, and I wanted to be behind the scenes. Um, I knew that I didn't know anybody, and I was going to be graduating soon, so what I did was I organized a lecture series for my school. And I sent out letters to everybody I ever wanted to meet in the professional theater, thinking that I would be able to network myself. I didn't use that word then, but now that's the word. Um, and be charming and intelligent and available enough that somebody may give me the opportunity to work with them after I finish school. So I invited everybody from... Arthur Lawrence, to Tom Hulse, who was doing uh, Equus at the time, to um, publicists and costume designers, and I invited Craig. Uh, this is in the mid-70s. He had just written this terrific book about Stephen Sondheim called Sondheim and Company. And I met Craig, and we hit it off. And then Craig asked me if I'd like to work for him and he was then, at that point, after the book came out, was doing a series of club acts with uh, Broadway composers and lyricists at this cabaret called The Ballroom. And he asked me if I'd like to be his assistant. Then I had a car, the use of my family car, and that was very helpful to me. So I said, absolutely. And that's how we met, and that's how we started, and we built, and we grew from there, that series of working with my heroes such as uh, Charles Strauss and Sheldon Harnick and Harold Rome even and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice and Stephen Schwartz and John Kander and Fred Ebb. I mean, these are the people that we got to work with. And for me, who was a young theater aficionado at that time, was like I had gone to heaven. So you hired him for his car. That's what we get. Some... Correct. Yes, um... it was a cutlass. Well, <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> but then um, we were there and we did the series and we were in, we had, it, it had been very successful and it was extended over and over and over again. And we're then finally at the end of it. And at that moment in time, we didn't know what was next. And out of the blue, like, you know, a shocking call came in from Joe Papp saying that he had been to the shows and seen them and he had read about them in the papers and he would like to meet and would we come in and have a meeting at the public theater and it's sort of like you've got to be kidding you know it's sort of like you don't get a call from Joe Papp 
Uh, so we indeed went over to the public and uh, sat with Joe, and Joe explained what he wanted to do and thought that we would be a great addition. And uh, to make a very long story short, because it's a very long story, um, he sort of asked us to come and, and, and be there and work for him and basically develop and find plays and musicals that he could produce. And uh, we did. We, you know, we developed a, a show called I'm Getting My Act Together and Taking It on the Road. We developed a show called Runaways. We developed uh, the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, which was the Michelle Legrand movie, which uh, was turned into a stage musical. Um, what else? Uh, the Water Engine is a play the that Craig, Engine. by David Mamet. Craig went to Chicago to see it and endorsed it, uh, coming to, to the Theatre Cabaret, which was in Martinson Hall upstairs, which he took a theater and he converted into a cabaret theater, and that's where we did most of these shows. And I guess there was also John Guare's Landscape of the Body, mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of other shows. And we were there for three years, working for Joe Papp and having the best time of our lives, because we got to work with every single person that you could imagine wanting to meet and work with. This was when the public theater was flush with funds coming in from Chorus Line. Chorus Line had just opened on Broadway. And so he also was uh, at Lincoln Center. He had the mobile theater at the theater downtown. So he was basically the and king the of New York theater and the park. So it, it was the best of times to be working for Joe Papp. And so tell me, we're going to talk a, a lot about this, but you're looking for shows that you think will go on to success or looking for ideas or arts. What, what do you think are those ingredients that make something successful that well, you, you were looking for as you pan for gold, as I like to think about it? It's funny you should say that, because um, if you said the word success, Joe was not interested. Joe actually told us that if we found a show that we thought would be successful and make a lot of money, he didn't want to do it. He said, I want you to find shows that keep you up at night, that you can't sleep and that you have to do or you're going to die. And if, if you don't feel that way about the shows, then don't tell me about them. And it sort of was like, okay. So it was a matter of seeing things that we loved and we wanted to do without any regard for whether it'd be commercial or not. Now, I'm sure that if Chorus Line wasn't running on Broadway and it wasn't making all that money at that time, and he was short of funding, he would maybe, maybe wouldn't have said that at that time, but he did. And it enabled us to do stuff that, you know, maybe we would never have done. One of the things, I, we always forget this, but um, no one knows that we had anything to do with this, but we did. We, um, in our search for new things, uh, I, I was friendly with Barry Manilow at that point. And Barry Manilow was friends with a guy by the name of Rupert Holmes. And Rupert Holmes had just put out a bunch of records that we thought were brilliant, really brilliant. And we gave the records to Joe and Gail Papp, and they listened to them and fell in love with them as much as we had. And we brought Rupert in to meet Joe and Gail. And... He had some sort of idea about a musical that takes place in a recording studio. And Joe, you know, was very brash about it. And, you know, he said, no, nah, that sounds terrible. I don't want to do that. Um, and one thing led to another. And at the end result of that marriage that we put together between Rupert and uh, Joe and Gail was Edwin Drood. And... Uh, that was the, the the baby that came out of that marriage. So uh, in our own weird way, we were responsible for Edwin Drew. But the, the one thing that, that you did learn from Joe is that whatever we fell in love with, we had to really analyze it and 
ask ourselves why would an audience of today be a period piece or something contemporary why would an audience relate to it or how would they relate to it and how would it reflect the way they live their lives and that's always kind of a question that we kept with us as we proceeded and left the public theater is why would an audience care about this I would say the most important thing that Joe taught us in three years was the notion of colorblind casting. Um, Joe was brilliant at it, and other people had not been doing that. Um, so, for instance, years later when we did uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella, and we had Whitney Houston and Brandy and... We had Whoopi Goldberg and uh, Victor Garber and Paolo Montalban and Jason uh, Jason Alexander and Bernadette Peters and and on and on and on. We had, it was the most mixed cast with, you know, a, a black wife and a white husband and a Filipino son. And what we discovered, you know, was people were panicked about it when we were going to produce it. And they said, you know, people are not going to accept this. And we said, yeah, they will. We, you know, Joe taught us that people will accept colorblind casting. And it went on to become the highest rated uh, movie in 14 years. And it was as a result of having a cast of Asian, Latino, black, white, just everybody. And that's why we had the audience we did and why it was a raging success. So you're working with Joe Papp, and he says, don't worry about commercial success. Just do what keeps you up at night. And then later, you're in Hollywood. And I'm just going to guess that the executives here in Hollywood didn't want you just (laughs) don't worry about if it's a commercial success or not. Something tells me they didn't say that. How did you go through that big change from one coast to the other? I think we stuck to our passion. Because even though, uh, you know, they do care about success out here and they do care about money, they do, they also care about what you're passionate about, even though it takes a lot longer to get those passion projects in front of people, that sometimes they, they offer rewards. So in terms of trying to play the Hollywood game, you, you, you play it to an extent, but then you figure out how to do your passion the Hollywood way. For instance, uh, you know, nobody wanted to do a, a movie musical on TV. But if we said, what if we got the biggest star, one of the biggest stars in the world at that time to star in it, would that change your mind? Absolutely it would. And that's how we convinced Bette Midler to do Gypsy, which kind of opened the door for this, uh, I would say, a movie musical renaissance. So it's it's following your passion, but figuring out how to sell it in this commercial world of Hollywood. And that's kind of something that we have followed through in taking projects that nobody wants to do, but putting it together in a way that it becomes undeniable. I'm sure you faced a lot of resistance through the years. With... Oh, all the time. <laughs> oh, I wish you we had a camera. I don't, think, I, think, I don't think that we ever did anything that was easy. I yeah. don't think we ever Still, did. to this Still, day. Yeah. I don't think we ever did anything that uh, was a normal production that you just... Not everybody uh, tells us no all the time. Yeah. I mean, we after Gypsy, we decided to do a drama. And the next thing we did, it was just at the time when Clinton signed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And there was a big cover story in the New York Times about Greta Kammermeyer, who was in the uh, military who was the highest ranking woman in the military, who inadvertently, while she was going through a security check, mentioned that she was a lesbian. And she was court-martialed and thrown out. And the story was absolutely riveting. And we decided we were going to do it. And what happened was, everybody that we talked to said, don't do it. No one is going to produce this. No one's going to finance it. Nobody's going to put it on network television. You're wasting your time and, you know, go do stuff that you can get made. This can't be made. So 
we thought to ourselves, okay, let's say they're all right and we're not right, we're wrong. How do we conquer that? And we did. We went to a friend of ours, uh, Barbara Streisand, who had seen the same article in the New York Times. And we said, what do you think of the article? And she said, it's fantastic. She said, why, what are you thinking of this? We said, let's do it as a television event. And she said, yeah, let's do it together. So we had Barbara Streisand, and then we went to Glenn Close, and we got her to agree to star in it. And once we had Streisand and Close, then all of a sudden, everybody wanted the movie. The project didn't change. It's still the same project that everybody said no to. Yeah. But, you know, at at that point, people would kill to have those two women... um, as our partners on the project and it not only got made but it won a lot of awards and got great ratings and was a big success but so there's an example of something that was impossible to get done but we got it done by attaching and working with people who were able to push it over the top so i think one of a producer's greatest skills is the ability to get people do some to do something you want them to do, uh, and you have been doing this tremendously for decades, getting people like this. What do you have a strategy? What do you, what do you do when you sit in these rooms to talk to people like Barbara Streisand or Carrie Underwood or anyone that has been involved with any of the number of shows you've done? How do you get them to do this stuff? What's the secret? Well, I think I think first of all, they're they're drawn to the material. Uh, and secondly, I think that when we meet with the talent, we listen to them. And I think talent really likes to be heard. You know, they don't like to totally be told what to do. They want to, they want to make sure that the people they work with are going to listen to them. And so I think that we've had the ability to listen to the talent that we've worked with. And so we create an environment where they feel that they are part of creating what we're creating but it also always comes down to the material i mean like for instance talking about serving in silence what i just the movie we just mentioned um glenn close was uh closing her engagement in la for sunset boulevard she had a month off and then she was going to start rehearsals for broadway to do sunset boulevard on broadway so she said to us like i have a month off i need to like recover and rest because I'm going to go do a Broadway run and I, I don't want to take that month and work. I want to, I want to recover. So we said, you can't, you have to do this or it's not going to get made. So she said, I'll tell you what, when is the script coming in? And we said, the script's coming in this week. And she said, give me the script. I'll read it. And based on how I feel about the script, I'll make the decision. So we sent the script over that, you know, a couple of days later and she called us the next day and she said, so last night I had dinner and then I went to bed and I tucked myself in and put the pillows up and I opened the script and I thought to myself, before I started page one, I hope it's terrible because I don't want to do this. And she said, I turned the last page of the script and I said, shit. I can't believe how good the script is. I have to do it. So and cut to the Emmy Awards. And cut to the Emmy Awards, and she won the <laughs> Emmy. And it was the first. It was the first time she won an award for anything that she's ever done on film. So you know, so it came down to it. If that script wasn't there, she wasn't going to do it. So, but she was an environment. She said, "I'd like Judy Davis." to co-star with me and so we went out and we got a Judy Davis talk to me about the evolution of the live telecast Bob Greenblatt actually did a podcast with a, with us which is great by the way so the listeners if you haven't heard it go check it out um, what was the first one like for you what was the from the idea itself to the like can we really pull this off tell me well I think we you have to start earlier because basically you know we did TV musical films on television, uh, starting with Gypsy and then Cinderella and Annie and the Music Man. And then after that, 
we were able, because of the success on TV, we were able to then to move on and do feature musicals. Because we met a man by the name of Rob Marshall when we hired him to do Cinderella. And he directed Annie for us, which was the first thing he ever directed. And um, to make another long story short, because these are very long stories, um, basically we got to make Chicago, uh, a, a movie that had been in development for 10 years at, at Miramax. And what happened was we made it, it came out, and it achieved everything a movie could achieve on two levels. One, it was the first movie musical in 34 years to win the Oscar for Best Picture. And the second thing was it was the highest grossing movie in the history of Miramax. So it artistically was successful and it was financially successful. That blew the, the, the gates off the, you know, the obstruction of, of no, 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 you can't do movie musicals. And then we did Hairspray. But you know, we, we went to that world and we, we did the feature film versions. And then we came back to TV and Neil had said to me like a couple of years before, I have an idea for something. You're going to think this is really insane, but I really think it's a good idea. No, so, um, you know, sometimes you have to look backwards to kind of have that inform what you want to do now and, and kind of in a new iteration. And so I was thinking about all the live musicals that were done in the 50s, you know, such as Peter Pan and Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Uh, and fortuitously, we got a call from Bob Greenblatt, who asked us uh, whether or not we'd like to do a new TV musical on film of Oklahoma. And we weren't so excited about the idea. And that's when we pitched him and said, we have something better because we had already been exploring the idea of doing sound and music live with Ted Chapin. And we knew that he was very open to it being as forward thinking as he is. So we pitched him what we thought could be a great event in terms of doing sound and music live. And without skipping a beat, he said, done. He got it. He understood the potential event nature of this and the idea that it could be something that could attract a massive audience. And from that point on, it took about a year to secure um, Carrie Underwood and then to go forward to actually doing it. And what it was like was trying to reinvent something that you didn't know how to do in the first place. So it was it was kind of, we were creating it as we went along, bumps and all, just trying to figure out the mechanics as to how to harness this idea, which was just an idea to begin with, that without a roadmap. So we were building the roadmap as we were going along. And, and that's kind of exciting. And we were fortunate that our instincts about an audience wanting to tune in and see it, seeing it live was was there, and even more so. Well, the next morning when we woke up after we broadcast the show, um, they gave us the ratings and they had to go back and check them because they thought they were wrong because they were too high. Usually they check them to see if they're wrong because they're too low. We, you know, reached 22 million people. And uh, in a, in a non sports show, I mean, in sports, you get those numbers for the Super Bowl and all that. But in a non sports show, you don't get those numbers. I mean, the Oscars gets those numbers and stuff like that, but not programming, you know. And we realized that, oh my God, we've touched a nerve. And all the other networks were, were meeting and having discussions like, what are, what happened? What went on last night? What are we going to do? And there, there was a buzz all over town about like, oh my God, what have they done? But we also had to contend with uh, a lot of hate watching too, and the negativity by a small amount of people that got on social media, which was also interesting because it was one of the first 
TV events that kind of ignited this social media firestorm. So rather than, you know, we had a bit of that with Smash, you know, there was hate watching with Smash, but it reached new levels with Sound of Music in terms of the, the, the magnitude of the audience and the amount of people that became engaged. So to us, this hate tweeting was kind of a good sign that so many people were actually engaged. You know, you had to put up with a bunch of sting, uh, but it, it, it was worth it. You know, the, the person that we felt the worst for was Carrie because, you know, she really had no idea that, you know, the amount of, of attention it was going to get and how much people owned Julie Andrews and the sound of music and how they wouldn't let her be who she is. And, and we st stood behind her performance and still stand behind her performance 100%. And we really are very grateful to her because she agreed to do it. And we're sorry she experienced that. But in retrospect, you know, she really set the standard and she it, it's the high bar to reach now in terms of an audience. Well, I mean, you know, if that Midler had not done Gypsy, that would never have been a hit. And if Carrie Underwood had not done Sound of Music, it would have never been a hit. And you would have seen one of them and never another one. So we owe a debt of gratitude to those women who were brave enough to go out there and do this live. I mean, Carrie live. Bette Midler was doing it uh, filmed, but, but no one had done a TV movie musical. And, you know... People were very quick to say, oh, it's going to fail. It's going to it's going to die. But, you know, in retrospect, you, NBC has run Sound of Music for the past three years uh, over Christmas time. You know, there's a little bit more dignity that, that it has achieved since that initial broadcast. And so, you know, we're, we're hoping that it stands the test of time as as something that created this this window for there to be more live TV musicals. You produce in all aspects of entertainment, movie, film, TV, Broadway. If you could only produce one for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? I think that it's impossible to answer because it's not an accident that How do you want to make a living? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that doesn't matter. <laughs> Oh, it matters. Are you Joe Papp? <laughs> <laughs> I <Yeah>. wish. <laughs> I mean, basically, the reason we're in everything is because um, we find it inspiring to go from one to the other. So, like, it's great to do a feature film and then to go from that to do a TV series. And it's great to go from a TV series to do a Broadway show and then from a Broadway show to, you know... The Oscars, you know, so we, we, we basically have been inspired and have never felt that we've gotten stale or cynical by moving around in all the mediums because they're so different and you're always challenged. I actually think that if we did one of them and did it over and over and over again, we'd be bored. And I think that we're never bored ever we're we're sometimes saying to ourselves what are we doing because um the three oscar shows we did were not only terrifying um but talk about hate tweeting i mean oh my god there's nothing there's nothing that inspires nastiness uh like the academy awards well the more people that watch it seems there's a theme here the more public eye you have on you whether you're the Oscars or the president, you're going to have a lot of haters out there. How, how do you deal with negative criticism? Oh, I have, uh, you know, I don't think Craig really reads as much as I do. And I have a pretty thick, thick skin and I look upon it. I think a lot of it is really funny. And then the stuff that's just plain mean, I just kind of go, it's like too much. But, but, you know, being some, somewhat, uh, perversely fascinated by by people's pathology in, in terms of what the what social media allows them to become it always kind of interests me. I think the, the only way to get past it is one way, and that is that, like, I remember having uh, 
a moment of extraordinary understanding of the work we do when we did Chicago. I remember that we made the movie and we were sitting in a screening room and Rob Marshall was about to show us the director's first cut. It was the first time that anyone would have seen the movie cut together. And we sat there and we watched it and we were, our jaws were dropping onto the floor because we thought this is one of the best things we've ever seen. And we thought if no one likes it, if it gets terrible reviews, if everyone attacks it, if it doesn't get nominated for anything, it's okay. Because right now, we're the first people to see it. And now's the time to decide whether we accomplished what we set out to accomplish. And we felt we did. We felt like this is the movie we wanted to make. We made it exactly the way we wanted to make it. And we can feel like we accomplished what our goal was. And if other people didn't like it, well, then they don't like it. But that's, we don't, you know, you can't do it for everybody else in the world. You have to do it for yourself. And, um, you know, we, of course, at that moment didn't know it was going to go on and win all those awards, which it did. But it was it, the greatest, most satisfying moment was not when it won the Oscar, but when we saw the first screening and went, wow. This is really good. You work in these various areas. Is there something Broadway producers or the Broadway industry can learn from film or TV? Is there something that you learn when you do a series or on film that when you go back to Broadway, you know, we should do this a little bit more in the theater? Or well, is yeah, Broadway, you, you yeah, just you do have a, a thing about, you know, all of the, the um, in, in terms of the way advertising is done. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean... I think a lot of the way ways a Broadway show is sold is is so antiquated and in terms of the shops that do it on Broadway, I mean, since there are like two or three shops that do the advertising and the publicity, it's like it they cannibalize one another and you kind of don't feel like you can feel special. So or or they they take some sort of model for some other thing and they put it on your show and and it just there's a similarity amongst all of it and it all kind of gets congealed into one big big sameness that and I think there are many more opportunities in terms of Hollywood in terms of advertising agencies and marketing agencies where you can get a, a little bit more of a broader point of view as opposed to the kind of insular nature of what the theater community is like. I think that... Um, Just in terms of the marketing and selling of a Broadway show. I, I think that um, all the stuff that you do, you learn stuff that helps the other stuff. I think that the, the single most impactful example that I could ever give, ever, is um, the Oscars. Because when we looked at the Oscars, we thought, okay... It's a TV special. We do TV. It's based on movies. We make movies. And it's a live stage show. We do theater. So it's almost like taking our experience in movies, television, and theater and putting it in a blender. And what comes out is the Oscars. Now, that is not the case for other people who produce the Oscars. But that was the case for us, because if you look back at our shows, we had more entertainment and more music and more moments in between giving out all those awards than almost any other Oscar shows prior or, or after it. So, you know, we we felt like that's who we were and that's what we contributed to those shows the three years we did it. Speaking about the marketing of Broadway shows and differences between Hollywood, Hollywood does a lot of testing, lots of screenings and focus groups and recuts and screenings again. Broadway doesn't do that so much. Do you think we should do more of it? Do you like the amount of testing that's done out here? You know what? I, I, 
I read all about shows that do testing, and I don't know if it's really impacted the box office, you know? Whereas sometimes when you when you test a movie or a TV show, it does impact how you may get a broader audience. But I don't know if it's been that effective in the theater. I know Harvey Weinstein did it with, uh, tried to do it with Finding Neverland. And I think Garth Grabinski was one of the first people to do it with Ragtime and all of that. But has did it really have an impact? I didn't see it. I worked for Garth during those periods yeah, when he was so, doing so that then, testing. Then you, then you know, because I, I read all about this and I'm going, well, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't this testing work for the theater as well as it does for uh, movies and TV? But it doesn't. But I, I So think... then I get, I think you just kind of like have to trust your gut and just see how your audiences react during out of town previews or, or, uh, previews in, in New York and then you just have to kind of trust it. it's more about trusting your gut in the theater but I think that um, what applies to everything is really watching the audience during the show yeah because you know when you're doing previews of a show on Broadway you know you sit there and you basically don't look at the stage you look at the audience and if something that you thought was hilarious doesn't get a laugh night after night, and if something that you thought was okay all of a sudden brings the house down, and if you see that people are getting restless and going to the bathroom and, you know, shuffling around, you start to realize that, boy, this doesn't work because they're bored. Um, and the same thing applies for movies. I mean, you can stare at the audience and watch them watch the movie. And I don't, I don't really pay attention that much to the testing. I think the testing screenings are very important for you to watch the audience, not to look at scores. Um, yeah, you're, they're, they're your previews. Yeah. I mean, because that, then again, when you see something, you go, okay, this is going to get a huge laugh and it's silent. You go, that joke isn't working. And that's happened time and time again. And uh, especially in movies, you know, when people are bored, everybody gets up and goes to the bathroom or goes for popcorn or something. And you know, like, they're going, oh, this is a good time to go because it's boring. Uh, so you learn so much about it. Um, that we learned a couple of things during Chicago, you know, because we had... We originally tested it with uh, a much darker ending, and we we made adjustments to make the ending seemingly a little bit more upbeat and, and satisfying. And there were certain things that didn't work that that we experimented with. You know, there was a, a cut of the film where we originally had class in, and it was interesting when we put class back into the film. We tested it without class first, and then we put class in. Uh, the numbers went down. Then we took it out. Numbers went up. So, and not it, only but that. we knew that, which is why we started off with without it because we knew that it didn't quite work. And not only did they not like the number, but they turned on Catherine Zeta Jones and Queen Latifah and Queen Latifah because they sang the number, and they didn't like the Queen number. As Catherine was testing really high, when we put class in went right down and then we took it out and tested it again and her numbers went way way up again <laughs> so clearly they didn't want to see Catherine sing that song it really affected them in a very deep way and then the ending you know it was darker in so far as one of uh, Rob's concepts for the ending was to kind of give the illusion that our merry murderesses were back on stage performing, but they had their comeuppance, and you had the impression that there was some sort of violence at the end where they were shot. I mean, because it actually ended with a gunshot and a freeze frame, and so that's there's the, we who have worked on the on the film know there's a little bit of that left, but. You would never think you you think that it was kind of a triumphant ending, a strange triumphant ending, because that's what these they got away with murder. 
but they were actually, they had their comeuppance in the initial cut. A question from one of my listeners now. Feel free to give us the exclusive. When is Bombshell going to be on Broadway? We actually are dealing with that probably every day. We're talking to book writers. We've had, you know, Mark and Scott have been meeting with book writers. We haven't settled on the entire creative team. So we are proceeding. If we're doing it, you know, Mark and Scott are extremely busy, so we have to fit that into their schedule. But it is very much on the, 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 the present slate of things that we're dealing with at the present. So what I, I would imagine by the end of the year, we would have a book writer secured and then they could actually start working. But that's just guessing. Do you think we'll see another Broadway-themed television show like Smash? In the future, um, anything in the works? I I don't know that we will for a while. I mean, I think we will, but not immediately. I think that the unfortunate thing is that the lack of success of the show, ending after a second season, um, was attributed to, well, nobody's interested in seeing something said in the world of Broadway. We don't think that was the case at all. We just don't. We think that especially because the pilot was a spectacular w work. I mean, the pilot. And also, um, it's, it's like one of those things where the ratings were huge. So people don't come and sample to that extent and give you those ratings if they're not interested. So they were interested. What was the case is that they decided that they didn't really want to see the show. And that was a number of factors that contributed to that. Uh, not even one in particular, several. But it wasn't that it was about Broadway and the world of Broadway. is that the show didn't accomplish what it accomplished in its pilot. Yeah, it was... It was it, it, Smash was interesting, I mean, because it was... What we loved about it was its ambitions. I can't say that every episode was successful, but every episode at least had something worthwhile in it. I think that that had that 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 which is why there is probably more of a following of the show now that it's canceled than there was when the show was on the air, as demonstrated when we had the bombshell concert, which kind of sold out in five minutes, which we were stunned by. I mean. We, we kind of thought that there was an audience that wanted to see it on stage, but we were really stunned. And it was, that, that was one of the great nights. Were you there, by the way? I wasn't there, oh, unfortunately. The tickets sold out too fast. Five minutes. No, it was five minutes. Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. Okay, this is your, my your James Lipton, Lipton question, question. so uh -oh. get ready for it. Be prepared. Uh -oh. I want Elm. <laughs> Yes. What's your favorite curse word? That was my favorite. Yeah. Oh. Uh, no. So I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to see you and knocks on your door. Disney's Aladdin. Disney's Aladdin, yes. And says, I want to thank you for your incredible contributions to the theater, to the film, to television. And I want to grant you both one wish. What is the one thing that drives you crazy about Broadway that gets you so frustrated that would keep you up at night, that would make you pound the tables that you would ask this genie to wish away in the snap of a finger? One thing? <laughs> Just one thing. <laughs> the one thing I wish, currently, if I were to be granted that wish today, is what makes me crazy is that there aren't enough theaters to accommodate all the shows that need to get produced. I agree with that, for sure. Uh, Craig? So I wish there were more theaters... Um, I have one thing that literally drives me insane, so I can answer this question completely obsessively. I despise the chat rooms. I think they are despicable. I think that they've taken away the creative aspect of, of creating theater in New York. If you go back and think about Michael Bennett when he created A Chorus Line, he was able to be at the public theater in secrecy, making mistakes, make, doing things right, doing things wrong, experimenting, trying. All those talented people created that show. Chorus Line couldn't be created today. 
because you'd have people tweeting and, and Instagramming and Facebooking and saying horrible things before it was ready to be seen. And it's they've stolen all the creative energy from the theater. And, you know, when you, you see when people go to a show, the first preview and they say it's it's absolutely terrible. And maybe the first preview was a mess because they weren't ready to start previews. But there's no opportunity given for you to fail and fix. Immediately you're condemned and immediately you're ripped to shreds and it's dispiriting. It takes away your enjoyment and your passion. It's, I, I just, you know, um, I, I find it to be so destructive and especially I found it in later years, uh, to be even more destructive because we had a meal with, um, a major theater critic and we asked the theater critic, do you read the chat rooms? And this guy said, yes. And we said, does it inform your review? And he said, well, I hate to admit it, but yes. And when he said that, I had this chill up my spine because I thought somebody is, is writing a review that means life or maybe life or death for your show. And they're going into the theater, not with an open mind, but they're going in there prejudiced based on stuff they read in the chat rooms. And that, to me, is sad and uh, unsettling. So, you know, I know that some people think it's funny and it's entertaining and all that. I don't find it that way. I find it to be the one thing that really drives me insane. Yeah, I'm, I'm picturing if the chat rooms were around when A Chorus Line was created and Michael Bennett or when any of these great visionaries, who some of them were a little fragile, if they had read them, would they have stopped doing what they were doing? You know, it, it didn't seem to hurt the creation of Hamilton, which kind of had the same trajectory. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think that it applies to every show. But I think that shows that are starting out of thin air that you have to have the ability to fail and then get up again and maybe you won't get up again maybe you know maybe the people who did hamilton were more resilient so i think that i i, I just find it very destructive and, and very disappointing and also what i especially don't like is what it does to actors time and time again you know, previews start and actors read the chat rooms and they don't want to go to work the next day. They they feel like they failed. They feel like they're terrible because people said that they were terrible. And it's because it's their first preview. And and I, I find that to be so upsetting um, because actors more than anyone on the show are more vulnerable. And I, I've seen it time and time again where where people are devastated by the things that are said about them. Carrie Underwood. Yeah, and the difference between theater, of course, and film and TV is Carrie didn't go have to do the show again the next night. These actors right. have That's to right. get That's there right. and do it over and over right. again. A very good wish. We'll see what the genie can do. I'm not so sure. That's a big tall order. I think the genie is not going to listen. <laughs> I, I want to thank you both for, for doing the podcast. But more importantly, I want to thank you. I'm no genie, but I want to thank you for your contribution to the theater. Everyone knows right now that Broadway is booming. And I credit a huge part of that boom to what the two of you have done, have done over the last two decades, starting with Gypsy and all the way up to everything you're doing now, including the live telecast. You're exposing the theater to millions and millions of people when you do this stuff uh, and spreading the word. And I thank you for that. Uh, and thank you all of you for listening. And until next time, I'm Ken Davenport. This is the Producers Perspective Podcast. Don't forget, last week's webinar, the ABCs of National Tours Explained, is now in the archive section of the Producers Perspective Pro. Check it out. Get a free 30-day membership when you join today. Theproducersperspectivepro.com. Oh!